Hey guys, Dr. Gary Linkov here of City Facial Plastics in New York City. I'm a double board certified facial plastic surgeon. This talk is on facelifts and we're gonna go through what is a facelift, the different types of facelifts, and we're gonna do a model demonstration of what it's like to design the incision on an actual face. And we're also gonna actually show you on this really cool model that we have, what it's like underneath the skin surface. So there's no blood here, there's no gore, it's just a model. A lot of times people think facelift, they don't really understand what that means. There's so many different names to different kinds of facelifts and there's a lot of confusion out there. So here I am trying to clear it up for you guys. And the other special part of this video is that we're doing this in concert with Lori Hill. Lori Hill is one of my favorite YouTubers. She's really fantastic. She has a very just keen eye, very intelligent, beautiful woman. She will talk about the different types of facelifts relative to celebrities. What is a facelift? So the term facelift is, a, is kind of a misnomer in that it's not that you're lifting the entire face. It's generally addressing the lower face, the neck area, and sometimes the mid face. But it does not refer to lifting the brows, which is the upper face. And so that is a separate procedure and uh, there's a lot of confusion on that point. The technical name for a facelift is a ridectomy. In a ridectomy, um, what it I mean, purely means is that you're getting rid of ridids, which are wrinkles. And that also, in a way, is not accurate because we know now that a true facelift, a modern day facelift, repositions tissues. It does, it's not meant to smooth out the skin. As a byproduct, it often does help with the skin surface, but we know that there are additional procedures that are needed for the skin, such as laser resurfacing or chemical peel, to really get rid of wrinkles. There are many colloquial names for facelifting. Basically, every doctor who does a facelift seems to bring his or her own name into it. And so it's not an ideal way for patients to truly understand what type of facelift is being offered. So a lot of confusion on the topic, but hopefully this clears things up for you guys and really boils it down to what are the fundamental types of facelifts. And this way you can ask your doctors, like what type do you do based on these fundamental types? As a general rule, the less invasive the type of facelift, the less effective it is it won't last as long. It might leave you actually with worse scarring. So a lot of patients come to me and they ask for a mini facelift. They don't exactly understand what that means, but it sounds nice because we can do a smaller procedure, right? And potentially get a great result. And it just doesn't often work that way when it comes to facelifting. You really have to put in the work to get someone to a better place, a result that's long lasting, a result that's more natural. The quicker route is often gonna lead you to something that's less desirable. It might be less money, it might sound nice, sound pretty, but often isn't the right way to go for many patients. So jumping into the types of facelifts, there's a skin only facelift that is a bit dated, but it's still performed by some people out there and it's the way facelifting started. And we'll get more in depth um, into each of these types, but just to cover all of them here. Then you have a SMAS type of lift. And again, I'll explain what that means coming up. For SMAS lifting, there's plication or imbrication. Plication means folding. Imbrication is an overlap of, of the SMAS. There's also procedures to cut into the SMAS. So there are SMASectomies where you remove some SMAS. There's a SMAS flap where you raise a flap and bring it over. Then you have ponytail lift and you have a ponytail facelift. Those are partially endoscopic guided procedures and they're meant to minimize the incisions that are made. And also this is a sub SMAS type of procedure generally. Another type of facelift technique is a deep plane type of facelift. And this is the type that I'm most commonly doing these days. And the deep plane facelift has the potential of addressing the mid face. And we'll talk about that in more detail coming up. Let's get into incision design. And when I do the modeling, I'm going to show you this in more detail, but just kind of give you a general kind of overview. There's a lateral approach 
to the incision and there's also a submental or or a under the chin approach that is done often in combination with the lateral approach but sometimes it's done individually without in isolation without a lateral approach so this stuff gets a little bit confusing but just to kind of give you a general idea when we do facelifts we're often doing incisions around the ear and in order to better get into the neck area and to reduce that banding that can sometimes happen. And it can happen after a lateral approach where you never address the neck in the first place. So most of us these days are addressing it at the same time during the initial surgery. So you have a lateral approach where you go around the ears and then you have a submental approach where you have an incision right into this crease here where it's not very visible, but it really gives us wonderful access into the neck where we can, again, provide that longer lasting neck result. That is sort of the general way, but there are still patients who benefit from a lateral only approach and there are some younger patients who can benefit, say, from a deep neck lift. And I'll make a whole other video for neck lifting because that, that's a bit of a related but a different topic, especially when it comes to younger people who have a very heavy webbed neck. They're not getting these incisions around the ears, even though it's called a, a neck lift. And oftentimes when we say facelift, we imply a neck lift, but it's two different types of neck lifts. So something to keep in mind. So younger patients can sometimes get away with only an incision here when they have a heavy neck but not much sag to their face because they're younger. All right, so here we are with our amazing model. Look at this thing. It's so realistic. My daughter loves poking at it and uh, my wife can't stand to look at it because it freaks her out. So there's only eyebrow hair and eyelash hair. There's no head hair. So I have this here in white to just kind of demonstrate some hair obviously it looks a little funny I'm gonna show you guys the incisions that are done for most types of facelifts and so I want to have some semblance of hair let's go over a pretty standard lateral based type of facelift incision the way that this is done is you look and see where your temporal hair tuft is so there's always going to be like some finer hairs down here and then you have your bulkier sort of club hairs and the incision design should respect this temple back in the day doctors would carry this incision all the way up this way and that caused a lot of hair loss and what that did was as this came up you ended up losing a lot of hair and some of those patients now come back for a hair transplant because it looks artificial when you lose this temporal tuft. The modern day design swoops around this area where the temple is full of hair. So I'm sorry this is not this is hard to kind of draw on but I want to be able to erase it later too. So this incision will swoop around this way. You lose some of these finer hairs, but that's okay. We're trying to hide the incision, right? That's the goal. What's the best way to hide it? So we're following this junction between the face that does not have hair and then this part where the temporal hair starts. And then we need to respect the ear. We're looking for the border between the ear and the face. So as I get to this peak, I then start to transition down, down in front of this ear, this way, like that. So I have a little peak there and I transition down here. And what I normally do in clinical practice is I sort of pull and push on the ear to look at that junction between the ear and the face, right? And where that falls is where the incision goes. So roughly there and then we have to continue on down and then we're going to start to curve around this way because you can see this natural crease in between here and here and so we're going to curve around that way and sometimes people will actually go pre-tragal and that means continuing your incision down this way so for like a man for example who's getting a facelift you want to make sure that your hair bearing facial cheek is not being transposed onto your ear, onto the tragus of the ear. So if you make the incision back here behind the tragus or on the tragus, you're going to bring this hair bearing skin back onto here. So we don't want to do that in men. We want to make the incision pre-tragal. In women, usually we're going uh, post-tragal or actually just tragal. Once I'm here, I then don't, I don't go too far back, but I go kind of right onto the tragus, right 
there is where I go and I follow that down. Obviously it's a clean incision, but with this little makeup marker, it's kind of hard to do. And then I like to transition anterior. So I go forward into this crease between the ear and the face because you want to preserve this intertragal notch here. So we go forward, we go forward right here. So it's almost a boxed type of appearance. And surprisingly, that actually heals really, really well. And this goes forward, then the incision goes down. And instead of hugging the earlobe too closely, one of the issues that you want to avoid is called pixie ear deformity. And part of the problem when people go this way right onto the earlobe is you can get a stretching down of the earlobe eventually when you reconstruct the ear at the end and you tailor your skin. So to avoid that, we go down maybe about a millimeter, just kind of into this crease, but separate, like leave a little space right here on the earlobe, a little bit of um, a facial skin there. And then essentially here, I'm cutting back this way. So I kind of square off this area, I'm cutting back. Now I'm post auricular, and that means behind the ear. I'm behind the ear, and what some people do is they'll bring the incision up onto the ear, but that usually doesn't heal as well as when you're going into this skin in the back. And it also, when you bring your incision up onto the ear, it can distort the cant or the tilt of the ear as things heal. So I try to avoid doing that. And then the question is how far back and how high up do you bring this incision? Because you want to hide the post auricular incision, but if you go up too high, what happens is once you are done with your lifting and you're tailoring your flap in, that height is such that your skin doesn't reach. Your skin doesn't reach and if you pull it there, then this is why this skin can actually lose vascularity and not do well. You can get a wide scar and sometimes the skin doesn't even survive. So I try not to go too, too high up, but enough to hide it. So roughly to about this point here, roughly to that point, and then I just do a straight connection like this. Straight connection, I don't go all the way up into this area, straight connection, and then you're gonna need to take out a what's called a dog ear, which is extra skin from the back here once it's all said and done. So I extend the incision into the hairline there. That is the standard sort of pattern, at least in my practice and you know, other people who do a lot of these surgeries, this is the pattern of, of incision design for most patients. So it's going this way, almost looks like a musical note of some kind. So it goes up this way, around, and you're always thinking, ahead about like what things could go wrong and trying to prevent it with the incision design. When we're working around the hair, usually we're beveling, we're beveling our knife so that the hairs ultimately will grow through the scar, ideally. So instead of cutting straight down, there's a, a bevel that goes inferiorly. Same thing here, a bevel that goes inferiorly. That's the design of the lateral incision for facelifts. So that's incision design. Then I wanted to show you the submental um, incision design. The submental incision is useful for when you're trying to tighten up some of these muscles here, primarily the platysma muscle in the midline to avoid these types of bands that some patients get. And you can do the lifting from the side, but there's still gonna be a high rate of failure in the neck, meaning that the aging effects start to show through relatively early after the lateral lift. So a lot of us have moved to doing both lateral incisions as well as the submental incision. And that's either done right into the crease, there's a crease here between the chin and the neck here right into this region and I can't really show you onto the other side because of the way the model is made but imagine this incision extending for the same length onto this other side kind of like kind of like this and so you can either use that crease which is the way I do it or you can go after the crease or before the crease everyone has like a different mentality on that but I generally go right into the crease and it heals well and that gives me access then to lift up the skin and work on the deeper muscle but also to connect this pocket back to this pocket and that really allows the skin to shift and to be repositioned appropriately. So that's the submental incision design. Now I'm going to show you on the other side what happens when you actually 
lift the skin. Look at this side of the head. This is pretty cool, isn't it? The skin's peeled back. The smaz layer has actually been peeled back on this model. And you're looking at all of the deep musculature. And most of what you're seeing here are the deep muscles. You're seeing some bone here. You're also seeing the parotid gland in this region out here. The yellow are the nerves. You've got blood vessels in red. You've got veins in blue. Really awesome model. And this model is actually meant for a filler, like to practice in injections or to teach people how to inject. I'm just using it for this purpose instead. And what we've done to customize it, I got this piece of plastic that's actually kind of cool because it's yellowish, just like SMAS is, is yellowish, right? Because there's fat there. I've kind of cut it down and I wanted you guys to see this SMAS layer because when we're operating, we're often primarily targeting this SMAS layer. So I wanted you to show that and I just have these pins holding this piece of SMAS smaz together and i'm going to show you the different techniques of what's done i'm not going to actually like show you like a surgical method with instruments and, and that sort of thing just because that would be a, a ton of work here but i'm going to show you just at least like drawing things out onto the smaz and i think you guys will get a good sense and then i'm going to show you at the end where the ligaments are it's very important to understand where the ligaments are so that when you're doing a deep plane facelift you understand where where to basically uh, sever those ligaments to allow better repositioning of the face. Jumping into the skin only facelift. The skin only facelift is also called a subcutaneous facelift. Essentially you're just going just under the skin. The pros of a procedure like this is that it's just easier to do. It can be done awake. I mean it's really just going right under skin. You numb it up and if you know where you need to make your incisions you just go under the skin and just sort of pull back and uh, remove extra skin and close it up. And another advantage of this technique is that it's safe from a motor nerve perspective. So one of the risks of a facelift is that you have nerves that come out of the parotid gland and they will then innervate muscles of the face and that allows us to, to move the face. So there's always this dreaded complication of injuring one of these nerves. So if you just are lifting under the skin, that's not the level. The nerves are in a specific level of the face and that's not the level where they are. They're deeper than that. So you're very safe from a motor nerve perspective, which is great. But what's the problem with the skin only facelift? Limited improvement. It doesn't last very long. You generally get worse scars because, which is counterintuitive because you would think like, well, you're doing something more minimal, then why would the scars be worse than doing like a bigger sort of deep plane approach? Well, the reason is because you still have a lot of tension. You haven't released tension. When you don't release tension, you get worse scarring. And then you also can get this very sweeped appearance where everything just looks super tight and pulled and unnatural. And that comes from this type of skin only lift. The ideal candidate for a skin only lift would be someone who's very risk averse, who doesn't want to take on any risk when it comes to say motor nerves, someone who's say unable to tolerate IV sedation or general anesthesia, and someone who's willing to accept that their scarring might be worse, but maybe it's a easier procedure to undergo. So for skin only, they might still use a similar type of incision design. Basically, you can see they've already kind of cut out around the ear, not exactly in the way that we described earlier, but still the skin has obviously been pulled away. So with the skin only, facelift you're going just under the skin throughout this whole area and you're not seeing any anything close to any of these structures right and you're not seeing your smaz is going to be down it's not going to be touched so this smaz layer is just like not even touched with a skin only approach so you're basically raising your skin flaps you got skin you got a little bit of fat under the skin and then you're pulling it tight removing extra skin putting the sutures in, but again, you get this sweeped type of look and it doesn't really look natural. A good example of the skin only lift is Madonna in the early 2000s. Take a look at her before. Here is Madonna before her first facelift. We see loose skin at the mouth corners. We also see a bunching of skin to her lower face. In the after photo, we see that all of the skin has been tightened and well-groomed. Her face also looks a lot smaller and compact. In Madonna's case, there was some residual scarring near her ear that was also a giveaway of a skin-only facelift. Skin-only facelifts tend to scar more than other types of lifts. Now let's go into SMAS techniques. So the SMAS is the superficial musculoaponeurotic system. It's essentially separating the deeper muscles of the face from the more surface fat that's just under the skin. It's an extra 
layer of muscle and kind of fibrous tissue. And that is what we use in facelifting to really secure the face in a new position and give it a longer lasting result. So back in the day, people thought, oh, you just go under the skin, you pull it tight, everything is great. Well, we learned that that's not the case. Then we moved on to the SMAS. Once it was identified in the literature by some surgeons, we moved on to doing SMAS type of work. So everyone has a slightly different procedure with the SMAS that they do. Whether you're just folding up the SMAS, as we talked about earlier, or you're potentially overlapping it or you're cutting into it. One thing to keep in mind with the SMAS is that the lateral aspect, the part closer to the ear, is your more fixed type of SMAS. It's just more adherent. It doesn't move as well. The SMAS that shifts more is your medial SMAS. That's a SMAS sort of closer to your nasolabial fold. So with deeper techniques, you're getting at that looser SMAS and able to really shift the face more. Techniques that focus on the lateral SMAS don't uh, amount to as much shift of the face and not as much repositioning. The advantages of a SMAS technique is that it repositions tissues in a more natural way. It's longer lasting than a skin only lip. It can improve the appearance of scars compared to skin only lifting. Overall, nerve safety is good with, with this technique. It's less likely that you'll injure a nerve compared to some of the deeper techniques, even though the deeper techniques are very safe in experienced hands. The disadvantages of a SMAS technique is that it does not address usually the mid face. So the area here that often droops and it will account for that nasal labial fold, you really aren't usually seeing much of an improvement with the SMAS technique. And it's um, not as robust of a shift as I just mentioned earlier compared to a deep plane type of lift. The ideal candidate for a SMAS technique is someone who's seeking a moderate degree of improvement, someone who has limited mid-face aging, where the nasal labial folds are not so bad. There isn't as much sag there, and that really isn't an issue for someone, so then you don't need to get into the mid-face, and you can focus your attention on some of the more lateral aspects and still create nice improvement. SMAS techniques, similar design. There's plication, there's imbrication, so the idea is either to kind of start folding, you basically start folding the SMAS onto itself. So you can take a suture and you run it along Along your SMAS layer and by running that suture you're tightening it up you're tightening up that SMAS so you get some SMAS tightening some repositioning that way you can also fold it you can take the SMAS and not cut any of it out but just kind of fold it onto itself sort of I guess like this is like a good way to show you on this model. So you can fold that SMAS, and again, by doing so, you've shortened the SMAS, and in so doing, you've adjusted the way that, that the face sits, and you've kind of tightened everything up. Then, we've got SMASectomy, and that involves basically removing a section of SMAS, removing, cutting this amount of SMAS out, or something similar, and then closing it, so bringing this SMAS up to here, bringing it up, and you're not really creating a SMAS flap that way, but you're closing it, and again, as you're doing that, some of the SMAS is shifting up and to the side, which is generally where you want it. Then you have a SMAS flap, and that involves cutting into here, cutting into the SMAS, and then taking that and pulling it back, okay? So that's the SMAS flap. That's actually what I learned in my fellowship. Great example of the SMAS lift is actress Halle Berry. Take a look at her here in the before photo. She has a bit of bunching to her skin in the marionette lines. She also has a little bit of looseness to her jawline. Now look at her in the after. All of the looseness and bunching has been resolved and Hallie still looks like herself, which is really key for this mass lift. I feel as though with a mass lift, you still look like yourself afterwards, but you look like a younger version of yourself. Hallie has such beautiful bone structure that a huge overhaul was really not called for. Afterwards, she looks just as stunning as before, but she does look younger. Now let's get into the ponytail lift. Ponytail lift classically implies the use of endoscopes, which are these cameras, there's like a thing called the Hopkins rod, and that's linked up to a camera that you're watching on a monitor. The classic way is to enter in 
through a sub-SMAS plane, so underneath the SMAS. And the biggest advantage of a ponytail lift, again, it's a lot of people call their lifts ponytail lifts, but again, classically, it's meant to minimize incisions in front of the ear. And that's kind of what spurred its development. The incisions are generally hidden in the temporal hair out here and behind the ear, but sometimes the incisions can wrap around in front of the ear if excess skin is there and needs to be removed. The advantages is that, again, it repositions tissue well because it's sub-SMAS and you have a limited visible incisions. The disadvantages are that it requires additional instrumentation and expertise because you need all these cameras and monitors and it just kind of adds the time of the procedure. It's not as robust of a shift compared to a deep plane facelift. A deep plane facelift releases all the ligaments, and we'll talk about that. The ponytail lift doesn't do that to as great of a degree. And it's also not as effective when you have a lot of excess skin redundancy. The reason to have a longer incision that wraps in front of the ear isn't to just make an extra incision, but it's really to remove the extra skin slack that's in the system. The ideal candidate for a ponytail lift is someone who wants to limit the risk of scars in front of the ear, if that's really important. And as the name implies, so you can wear your ponytail, even though you can wear your ponytail after a well done facelift of, of really any kind, particularly a deep plane. But if you really want to avoid all incisions in front of the ear and you want to stick to incisions in your hairline and behind your ear, this is a procedure to consider. Ponytail lift is where it gets a little bit different because the idea of a ponytail lift is to try to avoid these incisions here and even this incision and instead to bring an incision into the temporal hair that's like back here back here to so make an incision there and then be able to tunnel with endoscopes and go throughout the face and do the work from back here and then also to have an incision in the back again hidden where you can go through and again tunnel do your work there even though there are ponytail lifts that will still extend onto the front of the ear because if there's a lot of extra skin here, you need to resolve that extra skin. And some people ask, well, why can't the incision be shorter? It's a common question. And the reason is when you have a lot of skin down here and you're trying to remove it ultimately, you can't remove it from a tiny little incision if there's like this much skin that is left to remove once your deep lifting is done. So if you were to try to do that, you would get a ton of bunching. So essentially, you're using these incisions to be able to resolve that bunching. And sometimes it gets longer. Sometimes this incision has to extend up a little bit. Sometimes this incision gets to extend back or into the hair. And that happens with the more skin that ultimately needs to be removed. So the incision we talked about earlier, you're lifting from back here and you're making an incision back here. You're going in with the, with the cameras and you're going underneath the SMAS and you're able to release some stuff and then pull it back. And that is another way to do the facelift technique. A good example of the ponytail facelift is Bella Hadid. Here is Bella before her facelift with her beautiful large and wide eyes and full cheeks. Here we see Bella in the after where there's definitely a more modelesque and sculpted look. She looks older and more mature. So now let's get into the deep plane facelift. So classically, this implies a sub SMAS plane and full ligamentous release. And when we do the modeling, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. With what, what are these ligaments that he keeps referring to? You've got ligaments that are connecting bone to skin and need to be released to allow all that SMAS to shift to where you want it to be up and lateral. Four main ligaments are the mandibular ligament, the masseteric ligament, the zygomatic ligament, and the cervical retaining ligaments. And the release of the zygomatic ligament is what really allows you to reposition that mid face. And we'll go over this again with the model. The advantages of a deep plane approach are that you generally get excellent skin healing because all of your tension is on the deep layer, the SMAS layer, and the skin just folds right over it. Anything that's extra you remove, there's no pulling of the actual skin, which is really remarkable and that's a huge advantage. Also, because you're repositioning the SMAS and the skin together as a unit, you don't have an area often where it's just skin and no SMAS. And so that actually leads to better healing and a lower risk 
of what's called flap necrosis. And that's where, the, especially the distal end, the part that's closer to the ear, or especially behind the ear, can die because you don't have that good blood supply. And it's especially true in smokers. The deep plane facelift is usually quite safe even in smokers because you don't have that distal risk of, of flap necrosis. However, I should say that people shouldn't be smoking in general and you really want to avoid smoking for at least a month before and after any surgery, especially a surgery on the face. So just my public service announcement on that. Another advantage of the deep plane facelift, it limits the risk of that sweeped appearance because again, you're not pulling just on the skin, it's that deep tissue that's coming up. The disadvantages is that it requires a highly experienced surgeon who really understands the anatomy of the face quite well and you need to then be able with that knowledge avoid the nerves and avoid bleeding when you get into those deeper layers there's always a risk of more bleeding also the recovery time can be prolonged because of all the tissue that you're manipulating so that is something that patients need to be aware of as far as the ideal candidate it's someone looking for the most dramatic sort of long-lasting result but also i would say one of the most like natural looking results and it's great for the mid face so anyone with that mid face sag it's a wonderful way to address that and with a deep plane facelift it's again a similar design and the healing is really nice because when that skin just flops over you just remove the extra skin and then when you tailor your skin just falls and we're going to have a video where we we filmed an entire facelift for you guys deep plane and I wanted to show you how I do that tailoring of the skin so we'll have a future video on that but that skin shouldn't be pulled tight all the pulling should be on the deep aspects so one of the biggest points to make here and I mentioned this earlier in the lecture portion is that this lateral aspect here is pretty fixed. It's pretty fixed to the underlying structures, primarily because you have this parotid gland here, and it just causes a lot of tethering in this location. Whereas this smas out more medially is your looser smas. So a lot of the work when we're doing facelifts in the way that they've been done for a very long time is just working out here, but there's a limit to how much tightening. So you're trying to move all of this out here and into the neck from out here. And that isn't as effective as actually getting to these tissues. But to get to the tissues requires a bit more work. So let's talk about the deep plane. So I'm gonna erase this and I'm going to show you guys where those ligaments are. So we talked about the four ligaments, four main ligaments that are released during a deep plane facelift and let's identify where those are. I'm just going to adjust this here. Let's mark the zygomatic ligament first. So you've got the um, malar eminence here, this bone, and the ligament is going to be roughly there. Okay, so yellow marks the zygomatic ligament. Then we have the mandibular ligament and that's out around this location here and I usually will release that with the submental incision. So as I make that incision I go under the skin, I release this on either side and that allows for a lot more movement of the whole skin area and there's usually some bleeders there. So blue marks the mandibular ligament. Then we have the masseteric ligament which is going to be roughly here because you've got the masseter muscle, your deep structure, and when we're getting into the deep plane, the SMAS allows us to lift that, and we'll explain exactly why in a second. And then the cervical retain, retaining ligaments are going to be down closer to here. Okay, so there you have it. You've got your ligaments, four main ligaments, and when you're doing the deep plane, the goal is to go and release release these structures. That's done through understanding anatomy and through just careful dissection. The SMAS layer connects directly into the platysma in the neck. What we're doing when we're doing a deep plane is we're lifting up that platysma. We're going underneath the platysma from the side in the lateral approach, lifting that up and 
Then there's a muscle here called the orbicularis muscle, which is actually this muscle here. You can either go under the muscle, you can go on top of the muscle, but you're trying to create two different pockets here. And then you have your SMAS layer, your deep plane in the center, and you're trying to get through the zygomatic ligament. So you're releasing this ligament here as you're going through. This ligament, the mandibular ligament we talked about, that's released early on with the submental approach. The masseter ligament we release as we're lifting platysma off of that area there. And then the cervical retaining ligaments, you have to release the platysma off of this muscle here called the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So as you're doing those releases and you're removing that connection of that ligament that's anchoring the skin down into the bone, what you get is this great relaxation of that whole platysma and smas layer and you get this ability to really shift that smas up and you've now released the mid face so the nasal labial fold generally improves and all of this has now shifted up and lateral typically following the trajectory of this zygomaticus major muscle and you're bringing it up and now you have all of this smaz and you have the ability to anchor this down closer you know, to the ear, but you've now really shifted everything and now you have extra skin that just flops over. That gets uh, tailored into place and extra skin gets removed and then everything gets sutured up nicely with no tension. And that really is what creates a very natural neck and facial appearance. Great example of the deep plane facelift is Kim Kardashian. So Kim was in her late 30s when she had this facelift, and it can be considered for her an early maintenance one, as Kim had no real overt signs of aging. We see a jawline that has become tighter and nasolabial folds that have been diminished. A big difference of the deep plane facelift is that it addresses the nasolabial folds. It can address the mid face. Although nasolabial folds do tend to come back, it has the potential to make you look very different than your before and even very different from your younger self. So if you're looking for this type of improvement, then the deep plane facelift is for you. I hope that you guys understand now the different fundamental types of facelifts. Hopefully you can now see why some people choose one type of facelift over another. And when you go see a surgeon and they say, hey, oh, I have a so-and-so lift that's unique to me and, and only I do this kind of lift. I would ask them what exactly, what kind of lift are you gonna be doing? What's the fundamental type of lift? Is it a SMAS lift? Are you doing application, imbrication? Are you doing a SMASectomy? What exactly will you be doing? That's how I would approach the consultation. And I think every patient uh, deserves to know the exact technique that will be implemented to help them with their facelift journey. Thank you so much, Lori, for the collaboration. Thanks for your uh, insight into the celebrity world and always uh, enlightening us about the different work that may have been done. Once again, Dr. Gary Linkoff here, City Facial Plastics in Manhattan. And uh, yeah, hope you, hopefully you guys learned something here. See ya.